Okay, so I think we'll start our first session. And um, the first talk will be given by Dr. Stephen Friend, who is president of Sage BioNetworks. And he's going to be talking to us about scientific opportunities from heterogeneous biological data analysis overcoming complexity. So you don't have a timer, so maybe I'll, I'll get just this. Give you a little and also in yeah, both ways. Um, so nice to be here. Um, uh, thanks to the organizers, particularly to, to Carolyn. Last time I was in this uh, room for an event uh, uh, here that stood out in my mind was during the giant snowstorm. Um, some of you may have uh, been here. We're actually, we couldn't even get the food into here. The Hotel Monica was uh, set up in a way where the chef couldn't go home and slept in. And so um, I'm happy to be here. The weather is good. Um, and um, uh, I think my task uh, this time is to um, give you an example, to sort of give you a glimpse at a, at a world that has been working on integrating data that is adjacent to um, uh, working with in environmental data, um, to uh, try to frame the complexity as we see it, and uh, to um, then go to solutions and opportunities. So I, I think we sort of had a slight bit of yin-yang between Alan and Carolyn. We're going to do this. We're not going to do that. And I'm somewhere, I'm definitely in the middle. Um, but I am uh, um, uh, going to, um, I, I hope, um, by the end of this talk, leave you with a sense that the most important thing we need to do is to think of how we're incenting and rewarding because the complexity is so enormous that our structures for um, giving people credit for what they're doing and how they're communicating are probably as important as what Brian's going to talk about, which is how hard it is to get data sets that have been set up in all these different ways to talk to each other. So I think the paired talks between uh, um, what I'm going to give and what Brian's going to give, I think uh, hopefully uh, Carolyn will get you to where you want uh, session one to have gone. Um, in the biomedical area, that's, that's where we work, um, the um, excitement these days is in solving um, a pretty hard problem, um, which is to figure out what would it take to develop the contour maps that we think of in a geographic sense, where our GPSs allow us to navigate, know when we're going to the left and the right, up and down, between health and disease. So the, the big problem that is, is active in the biomedical world is how could you make it so you could give a device to someone who would say, you just ate a triple cheeseburger. You just took three steps that way and four steps that way. Because we think that world is coming. Mm -hmm. And we think that we have to come up with ways to actually get to that level of understanding of individuals and their disease and their consequences if we're really going to have an impact. So this is the problem, right? This is the simple problem uh, that, that, we're, that we're trying to, 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 to solve. How do you, how can you, because uh, we can't do that today. We live in a world of symptom-based medicine where it really is very hard to say, is that going to give me a heart attack? Is that going to do that? So the question is, <clears throat> what type of, type of measurements and what kind of integration and what type of models could do that? That's our goal. I'm going to go through five things that I think put us in a position where, from a technology standpoint, we're capable of doing that. But then I'm going to go into the, oh my god. So firstly, um, in the last decade plus, um, I think everyone is, is aware that the uh, a, a equivalent of generating the um, a data, um, not just at a, a molecular, but at a, a level of what's going on with the DNA, the RNA, and, and the proteins, um, has completely um, uh, shifted in its proportion. I was watching a NOVA program <clears throat> earlier this week where they talked about um, what happened um, when Hubble figured out that actually there wasn't just one uh, a galaxy, but 100 billion. Mm -hmm. and, right, that happened in the 20th century where people thought, you know, there's, there's one uh, galaxy that we're in, and the Milky Way is a great place to be. And then Hubble, using a telescope, said, guess what? There are 100 billion of them. And we're one of 100 billion, which each have 100 billion stars. That's the level of shift in amount of data 
that is omic data that's now being integrated with things that people were used to be tracking. And uh, the cost also, just to give you perspective, everyone has to put one five second uh, glimpse of cost, is a million times less than it was 10 years ago. So the cost to generate that data is now much cheaper than getting a CT scan. Right? So to get a whole exome scan out of paraffin is cheaper than going and getting a CT scan. So that's, that's element number one. The second element is that the concept that people were working with before, um, which was called systems biology, was one in which it assumed that you needed to know the equations and the components, and that you would somehow build up like a clockmaker a model, and that would be how you'd understand biology. So I call that bottoms up systems biology. And if you're working in a plisia, a slime worm, a mold, or something like that, it, it's almost working there. But if you try to go and ask about a veteran coming back from Afghanistan, and you start trying to build a, a bottoms up model of what's going on, good luck, okay? Because that only works when you know about 85% of the components and 85% of the equations. You can sort of guess the rest, but you can't when it's flipped the other direction. So a lot of effort has gone in now into biomedical research that had been done by physicists, honed by people at Google, and made money out of by people who use Amazon Reader's Advantage in what's called top-down modeling, which is where you set up the data and you don't go in with a preconceived this person's paper told me that RAS interacts with RAF. Okay? It said, I don't know what's going on. And instead, you use top-down modeling to build networks. And so the second thing that has been going on in biomedical uh, research, which is coupled to the first, which is all this data, is that people are beginning to make um, pretty sophisticated network models for a disease. And I thought I could you know, take you through 20 slides I decided no one's going to look at those slides anyway. So here's the take home lesson. There are about 30 papers that we have in, in nature and science, and there are 50 groups in the world that are doing this. But what they find is that those network models, every time you change some of those parameters, a different network is there. And the important thing is that is not wrong. Each of those are like snapshots in a movie, very valuable but not something as a particular that can be generalized to this is what Alzheimer's is. And so what we're beginning to find is that go to any disease, and in a, a sort of uh, um, uh, interesting way, each disease is defined by almost everyone who has that disease. <laughs> that the, the real contour map is actually not one homogeneous one, but much more complexity than, than we had thought. The third is that uh, uh, I think we have, because we're in the midst of this uh, uh, transition, we forget it, but you couldn't 20 years ago um, between two institutions uh, connect uh, uh, data, even, uh, Brian, if it was uh, compatible, but you couldn't, you couldn't put it all in one place for people to use. And this concept of actually having a central place where all the data is, I think, as important as, uh, Alan, what you were mentioning, which is all this data is out there, but, but if it was all out there and there was no one place that everyone could get to it, right? So the important thing is actually that the cloud is an essential point. And I'll put in a little pitch here, which is NSA stores its data in the cloud. NIH is almost ready to think that it's secure enough. And soon, I hope, will be. The fourth is that the um, uh, ability of citizens to be the scientist, citizens to say, I'm interested in myself, that started in this really strange quantified self movement where people put cameras on themselves and walk around and show everyone in the world what they were doing I mean, in the extreme, sort of like the first cat pages that were on the web, um, has grown to the point where actually citizens, particularly with more severe diseases, but as I'll show you in diabetes, are actually incredibly interested in themselves. And they like sharing what's happening to themselves. And they will do things like put these weird contraptions on their head and, and, and walk around in, in a way that you, you couldn't get uh, lab animals to do. And they're like, this is good. I, I will do that. And importantly, people are now, those, in, those 
citizens, instead of saying, I need to fund an institution to get me the data. Okay? I will show you that some of the fastest, in fact, affordable ways to get data is to not go, I'm going to fund uh, uh, UCSF to get me data on this. There's a much cheaper way, which is, hey, citizens, are you interested? That has a lot of issues with it, but it has a lot of opportunities in it. Uh, and then um, the, the, the last is that um, in the last, because of social media, in the last five years, and I don't think it's more than that, um, citizens and scientists have begun to start to solve extremely hard problems as teams of teams. So this is Michael Nielsen's uh, uh, area. But this is a picture of uh, looking at, at folding in RNA. Uh, Eterna is the site if you want to go to it. And um, what Fold It with David Baker showed, what Eterna um, with Adrian Truel uh, showed, was that you could take research problems that were, quote, uh, double black diamond, postdoc to professor level. And if you set it up in the right way, you could get people who were, in fact, in, the, in this instance, a housewife in Surrey who in her evening hours blew out the postdoc that was sitting in Berkeley. Okay? Th this changes the concept of education, and it changes the concept of who you need to solve your problems. And so the, the point that I'm making is that when we're talking about trying to integrate the complexity, first message I wanted to give was it's much worse than we're willing to see. Right? We just are beginning to see the complexity. <coughs> And the second message I wanted to give was that we need to use all five of these approaches in order to, to, to look at that complexity. That I think, for the most part, existing institutions, whether it's the DOD, whether it is uh, NIH, except NSF, are not engaging all of these. And uh, um, I think that there's a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility. And that's, that's what I'm going to uh, give some examples of. Now, before I do that, I'd like to go to looking at some illusions. Um, we can see optical illusions, um, but I want to go to some scientific illusions that I think we all suffer from before I go in to, to giving some of the examples on the approaches. Um, the first is that um, most patients, many doctors, and a good fraction of researchers think of drugs that we're going to need to treat patients as um, ones which are um, able to be defined by a cohort of patients, say 1,000, 10,000. And then people expect that if it's an approved drug, it's going to work in them. And I bring it up because it's not just about post-approval. It's actually about the way the drugs are um, uh, taken through discovery. And what um, is, the, is the problem with this reality is that a majority of drugs that are uh, given do not work in, in the patient that they're given to. So if you add it all up, right, a majority of drugs that people are taking every day are not working in them. So you go, oh, Stephen, that's a little hard. You have to back that up. So I'm going to give you one small example. Um, I don't know how many people in this room are on a statin, but a statin is a very commonly used drug. It's statins prevent heart disease. So you should know that 40% of the uh, people who take a statin have their cholesterol lowered, and 40% of those have an effect on Heart, uh, on, on uh, preventing heart disease. That doesn't mean that everyone shouldn't be taking them. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't take statins. In fact, I think it's really, if you look at the uh, risk of dying of cancer, and you look at the risk of, uh, of uh, dying of, uh, of a heart attack, and it's things such as statins that, that have made that difference. It's not my point. My point is that um, we live in a world where um, the concept of having a drug that's actually affecting the mechanism of the disease, not the symptom, that's working in the majority of those patients is, uh, is, is an illusion. And I spent eight years plus in uh, Merck 
um, as a, a senior vice president, head of early development for oncology, also for neuro. So th I know this. <laughs> and um, I, I think we should remember um, that when we're talking about trying to make advances. Um, the second is that this technology of uh, collecting alterations in, in people's uh, genomes, um, this remarkable, sort of almost shock and awe ability to, to collect all the, the data on, on DNA variation, I think um, has, uh, has us dreaming that we are within um, sort of reach of being able to take that data at a genetic level, link it with things that are going on in the environment, and that uh, out will pop this patient with this uh, um, alteration in their DNA uh, when exposed to this is going to have a, a risk of that. So th I'm referring to the fact that I think many people still expect that altered component lists are all that you need to interface with what's going on uh, with the others. As if you could make a beautiful big table of all the changes in someone's DNA and then do some massive um, uh, sort of um, uh, linkage with uh, zip codes for, with, with different uh, um, toxins, and you could come up with an answer. Over the last five years, and again, I thought this was more fun to look at an Egyptian mummy. Maybe people would look at the slide uh, more than uh, if I put up the, 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 the actual uh, data. But, but again, to the slides that I could have put in here, um, what we're uh, finding is that actually Give me almost any mutation. Give me uh, a, a, a mutation um, in um, the um, LARC gene in uh, Parkinson's, or give me uh, APO uh, B in, in, in Alzheimer's. And I will find you a patient in which that has no effect. And the reason is that our cells through evolution are hardwired to buffer changes, and context matters. And so the problem is those altered component lists, whereas they're like spectacular to look at, and there's some nice examples where RAS alteration in colon cancer makes a, uh, a difference in whether someone's going to respond to an EGFR in inhibitor. And you, but the problem is you go to lung, same RAS mutation, same drug, it doesn't. So the point I want to make here is that altered component lists are sometimes what people are putting in their grants. They're saying, I can just take this, mesh it with uh, some other element of environmental data, and it'll like all, all uh, drop out. And I'm going to argue, no. Um, you have to understand the, the, the wiring there. And again, I spent a number of years running a, a biotech company where this is the type of pattern recognition uh, type of uh, work that we did. Um, the next, I don't know if I want to go so strong as to say illusion. Um, is that our institutions, the way we have structured them, are well positioned to actually work with data in these new, new ways. So I could have put up any institution here. But what I'm referring to is, was best said by Garrett Fitzgerald, the head of translational medicine at, uh, at Penn. And what he said is, currently, our academic system punishes sharing. Okay? Now, that is an extreme, okay? And I don't want to spend too much time on, on that aspect, but I'm going to argue that unless we solve with an incentive structure for that, um, the things that we're doing, saying we could get these groups to work in a consortium, we'll get this or that, what I, uh, I will show you, what I found is it's extremely hard when they're going, I need my name at the first paper, I need it in a high impact journal, I need that cited a lot, I'd be glad to share it with you, but I've got to do that. Also, I think we set up the resources that are available to um, universities almost as if we're playing uh, some sort of Warhammer game. Um, and so people may want to go to UNC or go to Duke or go to Penn, but part of the reason for going there or not going there is can they get some unique advantage in a resource sense that actually, when it's so sort of built up and you go, oh, well, the PI has all these resources and all these contacts and this, I think we have to make it so that we allow people to, um, to um, not have that as, as a motivation, So because it locks things up. And again, spent time teaching at Harvard on that. Okay. Last, uh, last illusion. Um, 
I hear um, almost weekly, I could have put again in uh, any number of slides, you've listened uh, to it, um, leaders of many groups saying, we're just on the verge of uh, winning the war on cancer, or we've just about to solve Alzheimer's, or we're just about to do this. And I, I don't know whether it's because they think that actually to get money from Congress, you have to act like there's a, you're on the verge, right? And you just need a little bit more to get to, to the line. But if you look at our understanding of these diseases, I think the analogy that sticks in my head is alchemists in chemistry in the 1700s. I, I look at the way we're storing our data, I look at what we have, and they had rows and rows of books about how if I take this uh, branch with this metal, I try to get gold, this happens. It, the, the amount of data and sort of what people were trying to do and convoluted ways, well, if I heat it up to this and then I distill that. But the point is that it really was Mendev and the building of a periodic table that allowed people to understand the concepts of why things are happening. And I'm going to argue that actually the equivalent level of relationships between pathways, between what's really going on within the cell, not the altered component list, is needed. And that's, what we, that, that's the level of, of uh, so the solution will end up uh, being uh, brought about when we have the equivalent in many dimensions, right? It's not going to be uh, look like this, but, but there's going to be relationships. There are going to be rules. Um, we don't have enough data to actually see them yet. So um, as Alexa McRae, who's sitting over there, um, uh, and, and probably others in the room know, um, the uh, Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, has been working hard to, to look at this puzzle. So I'm, I'm now talking about our, one of your adjacent areas. And this slide, um, which came out of their December uh, report, um, talked about the need for precision medicine. And it gave a description of how um, the various um, molecular characterizations and electronic health records and clinical discovery needed to come together in a place where anyone could access that. Basically, in this instance, a biomedical information commons. And, and the, the strong uh, uh, sort of theme that came out was until there's a place where everyone can get to that data, discovery is going to get slowed. And the point is that layers of information, the person who's working just on proteomics or is just working on uh, methylation or just working on microRNAs needs to be able to have all those layers where they're able to be integrated together. And that if we're going to switch from symptom-based medicine to precision medicine, which was the, the theme of the report, that, that there has to be some way of allowing people to have access to that information and integration of, of, of that information. So um, I think there are three directions or three routes to get to that. One is to say, let's give the CTSAs or let's give the current institutions, the professors who are driving things, more money. They're, they're well positioned, move that on, and just basically take advantage of the structures there. And you would be crazy to not suggest that that's a good idea. The second is to say that there are companies who realize the benefit the same way as Google realized there's a benefit in having a way of doing a proprietary search. There are going to be groups out there that say, I want to take that data, and for a particular disease, I think that I can advance that and I can make a, a product out of that. And that will go on. Right? You, you, you won't stop that, and that will go on. And then I think there's the third opportunity, um, which is what I'm going to focus on, uh, which is um, what happens if in combination with those, there's an opportunity of actually having, what does it take to have open sharing uh, in, in a commons? So in uh, 2009, um, we started up a nonprofit uh, foundation for scale and scope with, with virtually no money and uh, eight people, and it's now 30 uh, people, and we run about 7 million a year. Right? So it's about 30 people uh, running that. And what we have been interested in is in being almost like an alpha test site, uh, almost uh, sort of like a, a DARPA for, uh, uh, in, in, in spirit, um, looking at alpha testing of things that we think would be needed for a commons, and then acting like an outfitter 
helping other groups, not intending never to build the, the large thing ourselves. So we're just interested in trying to get the first prototypes and then let people go wherever they want with them. And it's because we think that actually open collaborative uh, biomedical research where teams of teams can contribute um, is, makes sense. And so some of the work we do is in uh, collaborations with individuals and researchers. Um, I'll show you some examples of where we're using uh, crowdsourcing to take on uh, biomedical problems. Um, we actually do research ourselves um, and, and build models. And every model we build, we put all the data and everything we do in the public domain at a, at a maximum of one year after whoever paid us to do it asked us to do it. So it just it's a way of feeding the, the, the common. And then we spend a lot of time trying to help other people in, in the projects they're, they're trying to do. So um, I won't go through the list, but we've been uh, very fortunate to have good funding um, for almost all the projects that, that we're doing from the government, from pharma, from foundations, academic, and uh, that has not been a limitation. I'm going to tell you for the um, rest of the time about four themes that are approaches uh, that we've been taking as an adjacent area that I hope will uh, basically uh, lateral over um, to, um, uh, to what you're doing. Um, I'm going to start with impactful models, and I'm going to end with challenges. Okay. So now to the science uh, uh, part of it. I, I, I wanted to pick one example, which I think um, is uh, just coming out in cell. So uh, it's, it's a, it's a re recent example, and it's a hard area. So Alzheimer's disease um, basically is really tough. Um, there is ambiguous pathology, and there's a real question of what's a causal versus a reactive uh, factor. And it's all, often something that ha may have started long ago, and really what you're looking at is, is uh, sort of uh, secondary and tertiary effects. And the other is that it's very likely that there's not one cause of Alzheimer's, <laughs> and that diversity also makes it uh, a hard problem. So um, for this type of work, um, I'm going to tell you, so show you a three-layer way of doing integration of data that we found helpful. So the first thing that uh, we did, and this was with the Harvard Brain Bank and uh, data from actually all over the world, getting um, expression profiling, getting copy number variation, getting lots of data from different regions of the brain, um, thousands of, of, of patients, is that we went in and the first thing we did was construct co-expression modules which was basically looking at um, sets of uh, genes which were um, concordantly uh, shifted in the, in the disease state. I would argue a, um, uh, let me say, close to a naive um, concept that that would actually do anything. But the point is it organized. These genes are going this way. These genes uh, are, are going that way. And so these modules of co-expressed genes for this slide I've showed in, in, in color-coded. The next thing that we did was went in and prioritized those modules, because you, you, you've now organized the entire cell. We went in and organized those and, and basically uh, ranked them with regard to the expression synchrony with clinical measures that actually had to do with severity of Alzheimer's, had to do with uh, um, ways of saying this may be a more important uh, um, aspect of the genes that we're going to want, the modules that we're going to want to find. So now we're, first was making modules, the second was rank ordering some of those modules. And then the third was going in and looking at the genetic changes in these patients and taking eSNPs and using eSNPs to go in and do linkages that take the particular genetic information with the expression profiling it up. I can tell from the looks on the faces that I'm glad I'm only giving one example this way. But I want to show you what happens. This is the type of model that you get um, of, of Alzheimer's. And these um, color-coded uh, groups here actually now in a way that was unexpected and is a validation of what I talked about in terms of top-down modeling, organized themselves without anything else into biologically significant uh, components. And so there are aspects of uh, uh, chemokines, there are aspects of complement, there are aspects of FC. And the really interesting thing about this process was we didn't get led to the side looking at ApoB. Instead, what really popped up in Alzheimer's was this is an inflammatory disease. At the heart, Alzheimer's has to do with a reaction of something in terms of the, of the body. And um, it allowed us to then go in and have questions that you could ask 
is that or is that not causal or is that reactive? So once you've built the map up like that, you could go in. And I took a bunch of slides out, but that could be reflected onto a world that you are used to looking at. And what popped up was Tyro BP and TREM, which is sitting next to the pathogen IgG part of that uh, component as something we felt as if we needed to look at. Again, I won't take you through this slide, but we could uh, take um, and in a lab, with or without Tyro BP, truncated, full length, et cetera, go and test the hypothesis. And uh, we're able to show that Tyro BP TREM was an important way of looking at a risk factor for Alzheimer's. And if you're in the area, you'll know that in the last two months, six papers have come out, all from different approaches, showing that particular pathway, N not by this method, but other methods that um, have us um, thinking that you can build such models of the cell up. And now what we've been interested in doing is taking those gene regulatory networks, now linking it with the data we have on microcircuitry and neuronal di uh, uh, diversity, um, working to take and interface that with what we know about diffusion spectrum imaging and turning that into more sophisticated models that apply to particular patients. And Chris Gaitari would love to hear from anyone here in the room or who's uh, watching this if, if that uh, made sense. And all these slides uh, we have posted on the SAGE site. So if you want to download anything afterwards, all these slides are available there to, to look at. Um, the next that I, um, watching the time, I want to uh, say one minute about, but I think it's very important. We found that we could not get the data from three children's hospitals together because they all wanted to, uh, uh, to, they said the consents didn't allow them. I've worked with pharma for four years trying to get comparator arm trial data, sat in this room and had big dialogue about how you could get people to share data. And what we found was actually consents do matter. And unless the data that you're collecting is one that you can um, uh, share with other scientists, you can have all the uh, technology there, it will not uh, be allowed to. And so John Wilbanks, um, who's now our chief uh, commons officer at, at SAGE, has for a period of time worked on a consent that says, why not give control to the patient? And if the con patient controls the data, then the institution is actually allowed to share it with whoever they want. So what we have found is institutional sharing is improved by having the patient say, I have, I have chosen to share that data. Um, there are, um, uh, we are not naive to what it takes to do that. Um, this is an IRB approved process. And you can go on to weconsent.us to look at it. And uh, there's a nice TED talk that John Wilbanks gave a couple of months ago on this. So um, I don't want to spend more time than that. But know that consent is an issue. That issue can be. Uh, uh, um, cracked by several means, and one of those, it's not the only way, but one of about five ways to do that is control to the patient for that sharing of that information. Um, what I want to talk about instead was how do you integrate the data um, in, a, in a dynamic way. So we have all, I certainly uh, grew up uh, being able to share information and seeing articles as the currency that allows the flow of information. And this has worked well since the Royal Academy was established X hundred years ago. What we got interested in was four years ago, the software community, which started to have larger and larger uh, problems that no one team could work on and no solution was final, worked on how you could incent teams of people to work together um, in building software code. And this site is called GitHub. Um, GitHub, um, as I said, started four years ago. It now has over two million people, has over four million uh, repositories. And every code change in there is versioned. Every issue is tracked. Every project is, is there. But, but a very important thing is any project that you have, you can define who is going to see that in a very similar way to Google Circles or Facebook Friends. So if you're working on a project that only three people in your lab you're wanting to have look at the software, only those look at it. If you want it across an institution, if you want it across a consortium, you can do that. So the point is, this doesn't mean that everyone in the world is looking at everything, but it gives you an ability to have filters that define 
what it is, but what we have done is base, or, or, so what we have done is build a GitHub for biomedical research in a prototype form. So that in this instance, all the raw data that comes in, all the curated data is versioned. It allows us to track who did what with the data. And I would argue, particularly from a regulator's uh, standpoint, the transparency this has to be able to go who really did what. The reproducibility that this allows is essential as we go into situations where often you submit papers and there's no evidence of how that person developed that model and it's hard for the reviewer to actually do anything with it. So um, uh, Synapse is, is sort of a GitHub for biomedical data. Um, it allows many tools to be used. It can run on multiple platforms. Uh, we've been running on both Google and Amazon. You can record this data and you can share it with whoever you want. So we think of it as a compute platform for transparent, reproducible, modular collaborative uh, research. And to give you a sense of where we are in, in, in rolling this out, um, uh, there are about 16,000 uh, data sets, a million models. All of GEO is sitting in there. Um, the Array Express, the, all the TCGA data is in there. Um, the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. And for us to do this on governance, we had to set up something that the equivalent rid, uh, um, uh, sort of um, uh, guarding of data that dbGaP did. So we actually built a system that has the rigor of dbGaP, where you have tiered levels of data in there and can work on it. Um, and so that, that, that data could be shared among certain people in, 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 in the right ways. So there's a lot of data and models in there. Um, you can download the analysis. Um, you can see the code of what, uh, what someone did. You can uh, find consensus clusters. Um, the project is um, one of the f furthest along by working with David Hausler at UCSC. Uh, David Hausler, one of the big mavens in working with genomic data um, and TCGA, and all of those institutions up there have been now doing projects to try to solve some aspects of uh, cancer um, by um, sharing their models, uh, their tools, and, and um, the most important thing is all this is pre-publication. So it's much more the way the physicists and mathematicians do. Um, an example is we could take two, um, uh, ex uh, two papers, basically. One that was done in the UK in the Sanger Center on cell line sensitivity, one done at the Broad, and we could take what it is that they said they were doing and take various terms that were used to create their models and move them in and out um, uh, you, uh, and go, to, was this important? Was that important? Was that important in that cell line? So the point is, that that's what I call a geek sandbox, okay? We think you need a geek sandbox, no, to be able to have scientists talking to each other in, in, in ways and getting the credit for, for, for what they're uh, finding. Um, that led us to talking to the editors at Nature and Science and PLOS about could we have a way where papers, when they're submitted, actually have to have that level of uh, organization? Could, could you get the publisher engaged so that they might say, um, uh, I won't accept uh, your uh, submission unless you, same way as we have data standards, unless you put it in this uh, format. So with the Sloan Foundation, uh, Eric and Brian and Dave, have been working on a way um, to make it possible to show exactly what someone is doing in their uh, paper that they're submitted, um, basically along the lines of, of provenance and workflow. And so uh, clear science would assume that when you submitted, you'd submit the code, the data, the model, the figure, and the capsules. And that would allow someone who's a reviewer or who wants to work on it later to make it so that data so, so that we're publishing a paper is not an end state. Uh, that's, that's our concern, is that it's very hard to go in and work with someone else's data if it's sort of like, you can't look at the Excel uh, file on supplementary data and do anything with it. You can look at it, but, but it's how do you make that uh, usable? And then the, I think the last of the uh, e examples um, that I want to give is that um, this past year, we've taken up one more level to try to get what it takes to have people share. This is about breast cancer and about young women and their risk for getting uh, um, uh, metastasis. Uh, a little over 10 years ago, um, we worked with a team in the Netherlands 
to build a predictor of which women who had no lymph node involvement uh, were at risk for going on to have metastasis that uh, turned into, we made that data available, turned into Oncotype DX and turned into MAMA print. So, um, and it was the standard for, um, that, that every, I think most of the patients in the, in the women US uh, get to, to look at aggressiveness of disease. And we said, hey, that's 10 years old. Let's try to do this in a really different way what we did was we took a set of 2,000 women in uh, Canada and the UK who had 15 years clinical follow-up. We had expression data on them. We had copy number variation. And we got Google to host all that data in the cloud. We then went to science translational medicine. And we said, if the winner of a competition that we're going to run can beat the existing classifier and beat everyone else, isn't that better than peer review? And shouldn't that paper go in with no peer review? And they said yes. Okay. So Science Translational Medicine there agreed to that. Avon Foundation we went to and we said, we need to have a validation set from Norway. Can you help us fund a data set that no one can get to? Because most of the times when you build classifiers, people overfit it. They get it all working perfectly for some narrow set of patients, and it's no good afterwards. So we made it such that the winner had to be able to work on a data set that they had no idea um, sort of its particulars in order to help them put in terms that would generalize. And um, the other thing, and the most important, is that we said, this will be an open uh, challenge. So uh, uh, Kaggle, there are a number of places that run competitions among experts. But we thought, will people share if in order to win, working with another helps? Basically, the theme here, if you get people to compete, will they share? Does that help them share to say, I want to compete? So we ran a leaderboard where people could track. We, we um, first took six labs. We took Stanford, Harvard, um, uh, uh, UCSD, et cetera. And we had a, a trial period where the experts that get all, get, get, you know, the bulk of the NCI funds um, we tried their best to, to come up with a classifier. We set that as the standard. It took six weeks for a group who had never published their data. Um, uh, 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 I don't know if I have his name up here. Uh, Wei Yi, working out of uh, Columbia, to beat the groups that are the ones who usually get funded. He did it with, for no funding. Okay? He went in there. And we had people from 46 countries. We had thousands of people who got on. We had uh, thousands of models. And we took it through the crank. And uh, as I said, six weeks to get that uh, inside out that, that was not funded, that did not come from the, from the, from the standard uh, uh, sites. Um, since then, we now are working with the NIH. Uh, we're working um, with uh, various foundations to run a whole series of challenges, um, one in prostate. We're working on uh, um, one in colon cancer that are variations. And the clinicians who are really interested in problems are now coming in and saying, you guys are doing great competitions or challenges, but you're not doing the clinical questions we want. We'll, we'll frame the question. We'll help you. <laughs> we'll frame the, frame, the, frame the question. So at this point, I think, um, or right before I end, I want to talk about uh, what we think is required to accelerate and make affordable the efforts to build the models of disease. So I hope I have frightened you in terms of the complexity. And I would argue that no one government institution has the funds to bring this about by themselves in the ways that we're currently funding. And instead, we need to think of ways to have patients engaged with their data, with their insights. Um, and so um, working with uh, Ashoka, working with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, we've been asking, how much can you activate and engage patients to be partners? Um, do they, are they just uh, to be the person who gives the data? Um, how much can they be funders? How much can they be uh, 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 collaborators, et cetera? And we're running five projects now um, that are testing how you build a community out to work with the researcher at the institution, and how do you make it so it's much more affordable to collect the data, and how, when you want to analyze the data, you don't have to pay extraordinarily to, to solo efforts that are trying to do the analysis. And I just want to give you one example. Um, 
in melanoma, skin lesions come up and they get either seen or photographed, and then it goes to a histopathology and the decision is made um, that wasn't melanoma, it was. 19 out of 20 times when a biopsy is done, it was, it was not melanoma. And when it's melanoma, as uh, Barry Kramer over at the NCI will tell you, 9 out of 10 times it's influent disease. And there is no good way right now using experiential thinking to do that. So right now, there's no standard way. This is the way it loops. So what we've been working <clears throat> on is can we go and ask patients to go to institutions and ask the pathologists and the dermatologists there to allow them, is the point, to collect the skin lesion, the digital histopath, and the outcome data, and then in the cloud build a resource that we're going to try to build to a half a million uh, cases that would allow, whether you're in Australia or whether you're in a poor area or you're uh, in New York City, to actually have a knowledge expert that has that data. And the reason we're excited by this is DARPA is, uh, who's been looking at uh, like the satellite feeds from Afghanistan, looking to look at who's putting in an IED, um, have developed uh, technology. They have an interest in pattern recognition. And they've uh, agreed that um, they would help us do the baseline and then run a challenge off of that to see can you build better algorithms to look at indolent versus uh, lethal disease, if, they, if that makes sense. So this is a way where not for that much money um, that, that can be done. So this is basically the, the final slide. Um, I talked about um, the fact that if we're going to solve the complexity, the, the topic of this uh, 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 session, um, if we're going to integrate data, um, we've been interested, and I think it's worth uh, considering, using not just all this omics data, um, but um, taking advantage of the modeling approaches, um, looking at how um, engaging uh, patients could help in running uh, uh, um, challenges. And I think it's the only uh, way to have that sustainable, to have it uh, affordable. I just can't see where the resources are going to come to do it any other way. And um, so patents were put in place to um, increase uh, um, innovation. And patents are important. I've lived in a world where patenting a compound is extremely important. I do worry that the system that we have set up for innovation is one that hasn't properly set up rewards for sharing. And these ideas are never fully baked. They have to evolve. And so I think we have to consider um, uh, how uh, the, the, I think the talk that, Brian, you're going to give on, on making so data could come together. <laughs> If we got that together, what are we going to do with it if, if we can, uh, can do that? And uh, that's how we're going to get to building uh, the maps between normal state and, and, and disease. And just a, a last uh, comment. Um, April 1920th in San Francisco, um, we are um, running our fourth Congress. And this uh, uh, every year, we uh, um, fund travel and expenses for young investigators to, to come to be a part of that uh, meeting. And, there, that's still uh, open, but you can see um, that uh, the, the, the people who are, uh, we have coming have really been looking at um, how you take closed systems and make them open and, and how to get people to work together. So with that, uh, thanks very much.